James Watt. The history of inventors is generally the same old struggle with poverty. Sir Richard Arkwright, the youngest of thirteen children with no education, a barber shaving in a cellar for a penny to each customer, dies worth two and one half million dollars after being knighted by the king for his inventions in spinning. Alias Hope, Jr., in want and sorrow, lives on beans in a London attic and dies at 45 having received over two million dollars from his sewing machines in 13 years. Success comes only through hard work and determined perseverance. The steps to honor or wealth or fame are not easy to climb. The history of James Watt, the inventor of steam engine, is no exception to the rule of struggling to win. He was born in the little town of Greenock, Scotland, 1736. Too delicate to attend school, he was taught reading by his mother and a little writing and arithmetic by his father. When six years of age, he would draw mechanical lines and circles on the hilt with a colored piece of chalk. His favorite play was to take to pieces his little carpenter tools and make them into different ones. He was an obedient boy, especially devoted to his mother, a cheerful and very intelligent woman who always encouraged him. She would say in any childish quarrels, Let James speak. From him I always hear the truth. Old George Herbert said, One good mother is worth a hundred schoolmasters. And such a one was Mrs. Watt. When sent to school, James was too sensitive to mix with rough boys and was very unhappy with them. When nearly fourteen, his parents sent him to a friend in Glasgow, who soon wrote back that they must come for their boy, for he told so many interesting stories that he had read that he kept the family up till very late at night. His aunt wrote that he would sit for an hour taking off the lid of the tea kettle and putting it on, holding now a cup and now a silver spoon over the steam, watching how it rises from the sprout and catching and condensing the drops of hot water it falls into. Before he was fifteen, he had read a natural philosophy twice, though as well as every other book he could lay his hands on. He had made an electrical machine and startled his young friends by some sudden shocks. He had a bench for his special use and a forge where he made small cranes, pulleys, pumps and repaired instruments used on ships. He was fond of astronomy and would lie on his back on the ground for hours looking at the stars. Frail though he was in health, yet he must prepare himself to earn a living. When he was eighteen, with many tender words from his mother, her only boy started for Glasgow to learn the trade of making mathematical instruments. In his little trunk, besides his best clothes, which were a ruffled shirt, a velvet waistcoat, and silk stockings, were a leather apron and some carpenter tools. Here he found a position with a man who sold and mended spectacles, repaired fiddles, and made fishing nets and rods. Finding that he could learn very little in his shop, an old sea captain, a friend of the family, took him to London. Here, day after day, he walked the streets asking for a situation, but nobody wanted him. Finally, he offered to work for a watchmaker without pay, till he found a place to learn his trade. This he at last obtained with a Mr. Morgan, to whom he agreed to give a hundred dollars for the year's teaching. As his father was poorly able to help him, the conscientious boy lived on two dollars a week, earning most of this pittance by rising early and doing odd jobs before his employer opened his shop in the morning. He labored every evening until nine o'clock except Saturday, and was soon broken in health by hunger and overwork. His mother's heart ached for him, but, like other poor boys, he must make his way alone. At the end of the year, he went to Glasgow to open a shop for himself, but other mechanics were jealous of a newcomer, 
and would not permit him to rent a place. A professor at Glasgow University knew the deserving young man and offered him a room in the college, which he gladly accepted. He and the lad who assisted him could earn only ten dollars a week, and there was little sale for the instruments after they were made so. Following the example of his first master, he began to make and mend flutes, fiddles, and guitars, though he did not know one note from another. One of his customers wanted an organ built, and at once Watt set to work to learn the theory of music. When the organ was finished, a remarkable one for those times, the young machinist had added to it several inventions of his own. This earning a living was a hard matter, but it brought energy, developed thought, and probably helped more than all else to make him famous. The world in general works no harder than circumstances compel. Poverty is no barrier to falling in love, and, poor though he was, he now married Margaret Miller, his cousin, whom he had long tenderly loved. Their home was plain and small, but she had the sweetest of dispositions, was always happy, and made his life sunny even in the darkest hours of struggling. Meantime, he had made several intellectual friends in the college, one of whom talked much to him about a steam carriage. Steam was not by any means unknown. Hero, a Greek physician who lived at Alexandria a century before the Christian era, tells how the ancients used it. Some crude engines were made in Watt's time, the best being that of Thomas Newcomen, called an atmospheric engine, and used in raising water from coal mines. It could do comparatively little, however, and many of the mines were now useless because the water nearly drowned the miners. Watt first experimented with common wells for steam reservoirs, and canes hollowed out for steam pipes. For months he went on working night and day, trying new plans, testing the powers of steam, pouring a brass syringe a foot long for his cylinder till finally the essential principle of the steam engine were born in his mind. He wrote to a friend, My whole thoughts are bent on this machine. I can think of nothing else. He hired an old cellar and for two months worked on his model. His tools were poor, his foreman died, and the engine, when completed, leaked in all parts. His old business of mending instruments had fallen off. He was badly in debt, and had no money to push forward the invention. He believed that he had found the right principle, but he could not let his family starve. Sick at heart and worn in body, he wrote, Of all things in life, there is nothing more foolish than inventing. For what? His great need was money. Money to buy food, money to buy tools, money to give him leisure for thought. Finally, a friend induced Dr. Roebuck, an iron dealer, to become Watt's partner, pay his debts of $5,000, take out a patent, and perfect the engine. Watt went to London for his patent, but so long was he delayed by indifferent officials that he wrote home to his young wife, quite discouraged. With a brave heart in their pinching poverty, Margaret wrote back, I beg that you will not make yourself uneasy, though things should not succeed to your wish. If the engine will not do, something else will. Never despair. On his written home, for six months he worked in setting up his engine. The cylinder, having been badly cast, was almost worthless. The piston, though wrapped in cork, oil tracks, and old hat, let the air in and the steam out, and the model proved a failure. Today, he said, I enter the thirty-fifth year of my life, and I think I have hardly yet done thirty-five pence worth of good in the world, but I cannot help it. The path to success was not easy. Dr. Roebuck was getting badly in debt, and could not aid him as he had promised. So Watt went sadly back to serving, a business he had taken up to keep the wolf from the door. In feeble health, 
out in the worst weather, his clothes often wet though, life seemed almost unbearable. When absent on one of these surveying excursions, word was brought that Margaret, his beloved wife, was dead. He was completely unnerved. Who would care for his little children, or be to him what he had often called her, the comfort of his life? After this, he would often pause on the threshold of his humble home to summon courage to enter, since she was no longer there to welcome him. She had shared his poverty, but was never to share his fame and wealth. And now came a turning point in his life. Though the struggles were by no means over, at Birmingham lived Matthew Bolton, a rich manufacturer, eight years older than Watt. He employed over a thousand men in his hardware establishment, and in making clocks and reproducing rare vases. He was a friend of Benjamin Franklin, with whom he had corresponded about the steam engine. And he had also heard of Watt and his invention through Dr. Roebuck. He was urged to assist, but Watt waited three years longer for aid. Nine years had passed since he made his invention. He was in debt, without business and in poor health. What could he do? He seemed likely to finish life without any success. Finally, Bolton was induced to engage in the manufacture of engines, giving what one-third of the profits, if any, were made. One engine was constructed by Bolton's men, and it worked admirably. Soon orders came in for others, as the mines were in bad condition, and the water must be pumped out. Fortunes, like misfortunes, rarely come singly. Just at this time, the Russian government offered what $5,000 yearly, if he would go to that country. Such a sum was an astonishment. How he wished Margaret could have lived to see this proud day. He could not well be spared from the company now. So he lived on at Birmingham, wearing a second time, and MacGregor of Scotland, to care for his children and his home. She was a very different woman from Margaret Miller, a neat housekeeper but seemingly lacking in the lovable qualities which make sunshine even in the plainest home. As soon as the Bolton and Watt engines were completed and success seemed assured, obstacles arose from another quarter. Engines had been put into several Cornwall mines which bore the singular names of L. N. Cakes, Wheat Fanny, Wheat Abraham, Cupboard, and Cook's Kitchen. As soon as the miners found that these engines worked well, they determined to destroy the patent by the cry that Bolton and Watt had a monopoly of a thing which the world needed. Petitions were circulated, giving great uneasiness to both the partners. Several persons also stole the principle of the engine, either by bribing the engine men or by getting them drunk, so that they would tell the secrets of the employers. And the patent was constantly infringed upon. Every hour was a warfare. What said, the rascality of mankind is almost past belief. Meantime, Bolton, with his many branches of business and the low state of trade, had gotten deeply in debt and was pressed on every side for the tens of thousands which he owed. What was nearly insane with this trouble? He wrote to Bolton. I cannot rest in my bed until these money matters have assumed some determinate form. I am plagued with the blues and quite eaten up with the molly crops. Soon after this, Watt invented the letter copying press, which at first was greatly opposed because it was thought that forged names and letters would result. After a time, however, there was great demand for it. Watt was urged by Bolton to invent a rotary engine but this was finally done by their head workman, William Murdoch, the inventor of lighting by gas. He also made the first model of a locomotive, which frightened the village preacher nearly out of his senses as it came puffing down the street one evening. Though devoted to his employers, sometimes working all night for them, they counseled him to give up all thought about his locomotive, lest by developing it he might in time withdraw from their firm. Alas, for the selfishness of human nature. He was never made a partner 
and though he thought out many inventions after his day's work was done, he remained faithful to their service till the end of his life. Mr. Buckle tells this good story of Murdoch, having found that fish skins could be used instead of isn't glass, he came to London to inform the Bluebirds, and took board in a handsome house. Fancying himself in his laboratory, he went on his experiments, imagined the horror of the landlady when she entered his room, and found her elegant wallpaper covered with wet fish skins hung up to dry. The inventor took an immediate departure with his skins. When the rotary engine was finished, the partners sought to obtain a charter when, lo, the millers and the mealmen all opposed it, because, they said, if floor is ground by steam, the wind and water mills will stop, and men will be thrown out of work. Bolton and Watt viewed with contempt this new obstacle of ignorance. Carry out this agreement, said the former, and we must annihilate water mills themselves and go back again to grinding of corn by hand labor. Presently a large mill was burned by incendiaries with a loss of fifty thousand dollars. Watt, about this time, invented his parallel motion and the governor for regulating the speed of the engine. Large orders began to come in, even from America and the West Indies, but not till they had expended two hundred thousand dollars were there any profits. Times were brightening for the hard-working inventor. He lost his despondency and did not long for death, as he had previously. After a time, he had built a lovely home at Heathfield, in the midst of forty acres of trees, flowers, and tasteful walks. He gathered some of the greatest minds of the world. Dr. Priestley, who discovered oxygen, Sir William Herschel, Dr. Darwin, Josiah Wedgwood, and scores of others who talked of science and literature. Mrs. Watt so detested dirt and so hated the sight of her husband's leather apron and soiled hands that he built for himself a garret where he could work unmolested by his wife or her broom and dustpan. She never allowed even her two pug dogs to come across the hall without wiping their feet on the mat. She would seize and carry away her husband's snuff box wherever she found it, because she considered snuff as dirt. At night, when she retired from the dining room, if Mr. Watt did not follow at the time fixed by her, she sent a servant to remove the lights. If friends were present, he would say meekly, We must go, and walk slowly out of the room. Such conduct must have been about as trying as the failure of his engines. For days together he would stay in his garret, not even coming down to his meals, cooking his food in his frying pan and Dutch oven, which he kept by him. One cannot help wondering whether sometimes, as he worked up there alone, he did not think of Margaret, whose face would have brightened even that dingy room. A crushing sorrow now came to him. His only daughter, Jessie, died, and then his pet son, Gregory, the dearest friend of Humphrey Davy, a young man of brilliant scholarship and oratorical powers. Bolton died before his partner, loud and lamented by all, having followed the percept he once gave to what? Keep your mind and your heart pleasant, if possible, for the way to go through life sweetly is not to regard rubs. What died peacefully, August 19th, 1819, in his 83rd year, and was buried in beautiful Hansworth Church. Here stands Chantry's masterpiece, a sitting statue of the great inventor. Another is in Westminster Abbey, when Lord Brougham was asked to write the inscription for this monument. He said, I reckon it one of the chief honors of my life. Sir James Mackintosh place him at the head of all inventors in all ages and nations, and Wordsworth regarded him, considering both the magnitude and the universality of his genius, as perhaps the most extraordinary man that this country could have ever produced. After all the struggle came wealth and fame, 
the mind opens up its treasures only to those who are persevering enough to dig into it, and life itself yields little, only to such as have the courage and the will to overcome obstacles. Heathfield had passed into other hands, but the quiet garret is just as James Watt left it at death. Here is a large sculpture machine, and many busts partly copied. Here is the handkerchief tied to the beam on which he rested his head. The beam itself is crumbling to dust. Little pots of chemicals on the shelves are hardened by age. A bunch of withered grapes is on a dish, and the ashes are in the crate as when he sat before it. Close by is the hair trunk of his beloved Gregory, full of his school books, his letters, and his childish toys. This the noble old man kept beside him to the last.